Romans chapter 11, verse 36. Just real briefly going to touch that verse before we uh, move into what we want to talk about today. It's uh, part of our, our theme, and Paul says, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. We're talking about the glory of God. We introduced that on Monday. Yesterday we talked about Jesus and our need to see him for who he is and to understand his message and respond to his gospel. I want to, to continue on that theme this morning and to talk a little bit more about the gospel and what it does in our lives because you see the heart uh, of the gospel um, is transformation. The heart of the gospel is not just that we get a ticket to heaven, but the heart of the gospel is that God would transform and change our lives. And if we're going to live for the glory of God, if we're going to live for the glory of the one who made us, the one who created all things and for whom all the creation belongs and the one who sustains it by his power, if we're going to live for his glory, we must experience the ongoing work of the gospel in our lives. You see, the gospel isn't just about a ticket to heaven. It's not just about punching your card so that you escape God's wrath and His judgment and you get to go to heaven when you die. The gospel is so much bigger and greater. and God's purpose is greater. The gospel, the good news of God's salvation, is a message of transformation. The gospel is an invitation to live for the glory of God. That's what the God, Jesus coming and taking your place, living the life that, that we couldn't live, dying the death we deserve to die, raising himself back to life, seated now at the right hand of the Father. He gives us an invitation to live for his glory, to live for what matters. But if that's going to happen, if we're going to live for the glory of God, if we're going to bring glory to God through our lives, then we have to experience the transforming power of God in our lives. Because when God saves us, it's just the very beginning of what He wants to do. It's just the starting point of God's work in us. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says this. It says, We all with unveiled faces are reflecting the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. And this is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The very heart of the Christian faith, the very heart of the gospel, revolves around change, around transformation. Now, when we think about change and we think about transformation, you know, a lot of us are familiar with knowing that we need to change something in our life and then trying really hard to do it. How many of you have ever done that? How many of you have ever made New Year's resolutions? Alright, since Christmas was yesterday, it's going to be time for New Year's resolutions soon, right? And how does that usually go? You, you make a list of resolutions and then what happens? Somebody tell me, what happens with your list? Yes? Oh my gosh, I have no idea where it went. No idea where the list went. Sometimes you lose the list. What else happens after about a week? You forget about it. You forget about it? Kicks in. Laziness kicks in. It's really hard to keep those resolutions sometimes, isn't it? And you know, sometimes we bring the idea or the attitude that the transformation that's to occur in my life as a follower of Christ is my responsibility, or it comes through my effort, or through my ability. And nothing could be further than the truth. Because just as as you cannot save yourself, there's nothing you can do to make yourself right with God. You can't bring yourself into right standing with your Creator. You're separated from Him in your sin. You're dead, the Bible says, in your sin. And dead people can do nothing. You can't save yourself. Only God can save you. Only His grace can save you. And here's something you need to get. The transformation that God wants to bring about in your life is also something that you can't do apart from His power at work within you. Just as you can't save yourself, you can't transform yourself. Now you can position yourself for that transformation. You have to participate in the transformation, but it's through God's power and for His glory. He saved you to transform you. He saved you to restore His image in you. All of us are created in the image of God, but that image is marred by sin. 
And we don't always reflect the glory of our Creator the way that He intended. But in God saving you, He is giving you the opportunity and the ability, the empowerment to reflect Him, to reflect His glory so that we can be transformed and reflect the glory of God in God's world, in God's kingdom. And that restoration, that transformation is something that God desires in all of us. The Bible calls it sanctification. It's part of God's work. And I want us to, uh, I know we've looked at a couple passages, but if you turn to Hebrews chapter 12, I want us to spend a, a few minutes there this morning because I really think it's, it's there in Hebrews chapter 12. Actually, um, before we get to Hebrews 12, I'm going to stop in Ephesians 1 4. Would that be okay? I know you guys are getting a little work out there this morning, turning pages. But uh, in Ephesians 1 4, one of my favorite passages in my favorite book of the Bible, I think. Ephesians 1.4 says that He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be adopted, to be holy and blameless in His sight. In love He predestined us to be adopted as His sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will to the praise of His glorious grace which He has freely given us in the one He loves. Now, let's just check that out for a minute because I, I want you to understand why you should position yourself for transformation. That's what we're going to look at in Hebrews 12. But before we get there, it says, it says God shows you in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. Your salvation was something that God has planned and ordained before the foundation of time. Now, I know there's some of you that are Calvinists and some of you that are not Calvinists. Guess what? I'm not a Calvinist and I'm not an Arminian. Because I've never found anywhere in this book that God fits in either one of those boxes. God's way bigger than our little theological boxes that we get so worked up about. But here's what I do know. The Bible says that God is sovereign and that God says that we are responsible. And both are true. But it's comforting and encouraging to know that God chose you. And listen to what he says. He didn't just choose you to take you to heaven. It says He chose you to be holy, to be set apart, and to be blameless. It means with faultless, without blemish. In love, He predestined us to be adopted as His sons. Isn't that, that's an amazing concept. You realize God has adopted you into His family. You're now His child. And, and I know most of you are familiar with that idea that, of being a child of God. But isn't that an incredible thought? That God calls us his children, the God who made that vast universe that's so massive and big says, I call you my children. God's so big and yet he cares about the littlest things. He knows how many hairs are on your head. And in accordance with his pleasure and his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. You see, that's the, the goal, to give him glory. He has freely given us that grace in the one he loves. God saved you to make you like Jesus. Romans 8, 29 says, for those, for those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. And to live for the glory of God, we knew experience the ongoing transformation that only God can bring in our life. To live for the glory of God, you need to experience the ongoing work of the gospel in our lives. Otherwise, you'll never ever be able to bring glory to the Creator the way He's called you to. So, Getting to Hebrews 12 now. Thanks for letting me take that little detour. Because I think it's really, really important when we think about why. Don't you, when you do something, how many of you like to know why? All right? How many of you are one of those people who just always says, well, why? All right, we want to know why. If there's a rule, there's something we're told to do, why am I doing this? And I want you to know, why should I position myself? Why should I go through the effort of positioning myself so that God's transforming work can be accomplished in my life? And it's because He's called me. He's chosen me. He loved me. He called me to be holy and blameless. He called you to be holy and blameless in His sight. He's called you to live for His glory. He's given you the opportunity to live for something significant and amazing. God has a great plan for your life and that's why we should position ourselves so his transforming work can be accomplished in our lives. Now these verses here are familiar to many of you but let's just read them together. The author of Hebrews says, therefore since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. 
Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter, your translation may say author and finisher of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. In the chapter before, the author of Hebrews has talked about these great men of God who had gone before, who served God faithfully, who lived for God in, in a godless world, many of whom were, were brutally killed for their willingness to serve and follow God. And he says, therefore, since we are surrounded by all these witnesses, these people who have witnessed God's faithfulness, they've witnessed to us about God's goodness and the worthiness of living for our Creator. He says, since we have these examples who are witnesses to us, he says, let us lay aside every weight. How many of you are runners? All right, several of you are runners. I like to get exercise. I love to play frisbee, as you who have been out on the frisbee can tell. But there's one thing I just hate to do, and that's just to go for a run. I mean, it's just, I, I don't know if I'm too ADD, I get bored. I, I, it's just, I just don't like to just go for a run. But I know for you that do, you love it, it's great. How many of you, when you go for a run, pack on as much weight as possible, as many clothes, you strap some extra weights on your arms, legs, anybody do that? All right, no, you don't want to do that, especially if you're running in a race, right? All right, I lived on the track hall when I was in college. And uh, first of all, it was a very smelly place because they all left their shoes in the hallway. And runner's shoes are, are as gross as they get. Just some free information for you. <laughs> but I know that those track runners, they wore the lightest shoes possible, the lightest clothes possible, because they didn't want anything to hold them back. And <coughs> as we look at faith, it says we need to lay aside every weight in positioning ourselves so that God's transforming power can be at work in us. We need to deal with weights that we carry around. And, and it's not necessarily things that are wrong or bad, but things that become a distraction to what God wants to do in our life. Things that are unnecessary. Sometimes there's weights that hold us back. It could be a hobby, it could be TV, it could be internet, it could be texting. Things that aren't bad, but things that are keeping you from your time with God, keeping you from experiencing those quiet moments with God. You know, one of the things I love about being here is we can be away from technology a little bit, right? And isn't it amazing how you can start to hear from God when the noise quiets down? There's weights that we need to let go. In 1845, an ill-fated Franklin expedition sailed from England to find passage across the Arctic Ocean. The crew loaded two sailing ships with a lot of things they didn't need. A 1,200 volume library, fine china, crystal goblets, sterling silverware for each officer with his initials engraved on the handles, because that's important. Got to know which fork is yours. <laughs> Amazingly, each ship only took a 12 day supply of coal for their auxiliary steam engines. They were sailing ships. The ships became trapped in a vast frozen plain of ice and after several months, the leader of the expedition, Lord Franklin, died. The men decided to trek to safety in small groups, but none of them survived. One story was especially heartbreaking. Two of the officers pulled a sled for 65 miles across the ice trying to reach safety. When their bodies were found and the sled was open, this is what they found inside. They found a sled filled with silver. Nothing wrong with silver. But in a survival situation, it was unnecessary weight that may have led to their inability to get help. They contributed to their own demise by carrying what they didn't need. And you know, sometimes we do that in life. We carry around baggage that we don't need. And maybe today God is going to bring to your heart or to your mind the fact that there's some baggage that you need to deal with. There's some weights that you're carrying around and you know, hey, this thing isn't necessarily bad. It's not necessarily evil but I know it's keeping me from being close to my Creator. I know it's keeping me from being near to God. And unless we're close and near, unless our lives are open to Him, unless we position ourselves where we can hear from God in His Word and in prayer on a regular basis, we're not going to, experiencing the tran not going to be experiencing the transformation that God has for us. And the author of Hebrews goes on and he says, not only do we need to lay aside every weight, but he says the sin which clings so closely. Now there's a few different interpretations here, but it seems likely 
that he's referring to particular sin in our life. And most of us, if we'd be honest, and sometimes it's hard to be honest, isn't it? Especially as Christians, because we sometimes feel pressure to compare ourselves to others or feel like we need to have an image where people think we're godlier than we are. Anybody ever struggle with that? All right, maybe you know somebody like that. Is that better? All right. You know, one of the things that I want you to know and understand is that God desires honesty. And here's something that we can all be honest about. None of us are perfect. None of us are living out our faith perfectly. We all have flaws. We all have struggles with sin. We all experience temptation. Are we okay with that? Can we admit that? I want you to know you're in a place of safety. You're in a place where, where you have people that you can talk to. Your counselors... If you go to them and talk to them about a struggle that you're having, even if it's a sin, they're not going to slap you, all right? I promise. They're not going to look down on you. They're not going to think that you aren't good. They're going to know that you're normal, and they'll help you. But sin always grinds to a halt the transformation process in our life. And Satan, he opposes all that God does. And so he's constantly going to throw temptation at you. We're going to talk specifically about temptation next week. So if you're going to be here next week, you'll hear about that. If you're not planning on being here next week, you should stay for next week. Not just to hear my messages, because God has a great plan for you, and we'd love for you to stay. But sin is something we have to deal with in life. And if we're going to experience the transformation of God, we have to deal with the sin that clings closely. That means we have to be honest with it. That means we have to get it out in the open. That means to repent, to turn from it, to ask God to forgive us. But it also usually means to let someone else know. To say, hey, I need some help. I need some accountability. I need some encouragement because there's some sin in my life. And sin will halt the transformation process of God in your life. Sin makes you stupid. All right. If you were here a few years ago, we talked about stupid exits on the highway of life. All right. How many of you? Anybody? Was anybody here for that? All right. Just a few of you. All right. We talked about how when you're traveling down the road of life and you're going down a highway, there's all these signs that try to convince you why you should get off at the next exit. Right? If you've ever driven south on I-95 and you've made it to the north and South Carolina border, right? And all the Pedro says, stop it south of the border, it's going to be great, it's going to be wonderful, and you get there and you're like, wow, that didn't really live up to expectations. <laughs> but in the same way, Satan is always going to say, hey, I've got a great opportunity for you, just get off the exit. I've got something that will be great, but it will destroy your life. And so we need to deal with sin. And if you know there's a sin that you're struggling with, most of us have one or two that are really, really troubling. That's why it says it clings closely. You ever notice how you just, you keep doing the same thing and you hate it and you ask God to forgive and you keep doing it again. Anyone else been there? Please tell me I'm not the only one. Thank you. All right. But we have to deal with that. We have to work through that if we're going to experience the transformation that God has for us. We're to run with endurance. How do we do that? Because if I know anything about running is you get tired. But if there's a goal in mind, once you see the finish line, you get a little bit more energy, don't you? And that's a key. And a key to running the Christian life, positioning yourself for the transformation that God has for you, is to keep your eyes on Jesus. Because it's not about you, right? It's all about Him. It's all about His glory. And so the way that we experience this, the way that we we deal with the weight and we deal with the sin, the way that we run with endurance is to keep our eyes on Jesus. Because it's all about Him. And it's all about His glory. And it's all about His kingdom. He's the reason for our transformation. Alright? It's what He did for us. And it's His power that accomplishes us. And so we have to get our eyes off of ourselves and onto Jesus. When you get your eyes on Jesus, you'll position yourself for the transformation that God has for you. He's the author and finisher of your faith. That means He's the originator. He's the one who saved you. He's the one who made it possible for you to be saved. And He's the one who makes it possible for you to be transformed. It's all about Him. I think it's pretty amazing as you go back and if you have your Bible still open and you look back there in Hebrews 12. It says that we're to, to, to keep our eyes on Jesus. 
the author and the finisher of our faith. And it says, for the joy that was set before him, he what? He endured the cross, despising its shame. Jesus endured the cross for you. And the most painful part about the cross was not the nails and not the crown of thorns. Although I'm sure that as far as physical pain, there probably wasn't anything more excruciating than what Jesus went through. But as great and as intense as that physical pain was, the shame of God, pure, holy, perfect, taking your sin and my sin upon himself was incredible. I mean, think about how you feel when you know you've sinned and you haven't dealt with it yet. And you feel guilty and you feel ashamed and embarrassed and dirty. And that's just one sin you're dealing with. The Creator took your sin, all of your sin, the sin of the whole world upon Himself. But the reason He did it was because He loved you and because He wanted His kingdom purposes to be accomplished in you. And so for the joy that was set before Him, because He could see what was going to happen, because He knew what His death would accomplish, He willingly went there for you. And it's the cross that reminds us that God has a great plan for our life. And that plan is to transform us, to restore us, so that our lives can bring glory to Him. That's the heart of the gospel. It's not just about getting saved. It's not just about going to heaven, which is going to be amazing. We're going to live in the kingdom of God forever. Heaven is going to come down and join with the newly created earth, and we're going to get to enjoy it and experience it forever and ever and ever and ever. And that's an incredible hope and an incredible future that we all have. But that's not all the gospel is. The gospel is about here and now experiencing the life of God, the power of God, the transformation that God wants to work in you. Jesus endured the cross because of the joy that would come from what would happen. And in the same way, we position ourselves for transformation. We say, you know, it's worth it to make the sacrifices that are required. It's worth it to deal with the weights. It's worth it to deal with the sin. It's worth keeping my eyes on Jesus because there's joy that comes from experiencing transforming power. There's joy that comes from living in the will of God. I promise you that. Joy is found in God. He's the giver and the source of joy. And God wants to make your life His restoration project. Grace that saves you, transforms you. When God saves you, it's just the beginning of His work. But we have to position ourselves for that work. We don't do the transforming. It's, you know, the Christian life is not turning over a new leaf. All right? How many of you have turned over new leaves before, right? You know, I mean, I went through a whole tree before. It, it, it doesn't work. All right? So if you uh, walk across campus and you see a tree without leaves, you'll know that was just me trying to turn over a new leaf. It's not about turning over a new leaf. It's about living a new life. The life that God gives you and puts in you. And it's through His grace and through His power. God wants to make your life His restoration project. And He wants to restore His image in you so that you can more fully and fully, as you live your life, bring glory and honor to God. And there's nothing greater to live for. Why? Because from Him, through Him, and to Him are what? All things. That's what life's about. As He restores His image in you, you'll be more and more able to reflect His glory. I want to challenge you this morning to see your life through, through God's eyes. As we get ready to wrap up our thoughts this morning, here's where I want to bring your thoughts to. I want you to see your life not through your eyes, but through God's eyes. I, I want you to try to look at yourself the way he looks at you. Because we all look at ourselves differently, don't we? Some of you, you look at yourself and you look in the mirror and you think, Wow, I am some of God's very best work. <laughs> I know there's a few of you and you're probably on this side of the room, alright? And there's some of you, this, whether it's comparing yourself to others, some of you struggle to feel worthy or accepted or good enough. But I want you to see yourself through God's eyes. Because God looks at you and He says, I love you. I chose you. I created you. I gave my Son for you. And I love you with an unconditional love. And God loves you because He chooses to love you. It's not based on your performance. All right? It's not based on, on how well you're doing. All right? God's love is unconditional. 
He loves you unconditionally. He gave His Son for you sacrificially. He redeemed you from the slavery of sin. He paid the price of your redemption. He has set you free to live for His glory. And when we see our life through those eyes, we say, this is why it's worth positioning myself so that God can do His work in my life. So I want to ask you these questions. Is there a weight that you need to let go? I really want you to just honestly think, is there something in my life, maybe it's not a sin, but I know if I'm really honest, this thing distracts me from my walk with God. This thing keeps me from experiencing what God has for me. Is there a weight you need to let go? Is there a sin you need to deal with? Is there a sin that that you're struggling with and you need to get help with? You're in an amazing place to do something about that. Because there's people around here, counselors, faculty, me, Mr. Haynes, people who love you, who you can talk to, will pray with you, will help you, will encourage you, because it's worth dealing with that sin. Because God has something better and He can set you free. He's waiting and willing to forgive you and to let His power change you and transform you. And then lastly, are your eyes on Jesus. Because when it all comes down to it, that's the heart of transformation, is keeping our eyes on Him. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one who saves us. He's the one who transforms us. It's all about Him. And if you keep your eyes on Him, if you keep your focus on Him, you'll experience the transforming power of His Spirit in your life. And you'll be positioned to live for His glory. And nothing is greater than that. It's not the life that you live for God. You know, so many times you think, I'm going to live my life for God. And God says, that's actually not what I call you to do. Let my life be lived through you. It's the life of God lived through you that accomplishes God's glory and God's purposes. Would you bow your heads this morning? I, I want you to, to just be honest this morning with God. He already knows everything about you. He knows every corner of your heart. He knows every recess of your mind. He knows exactly where you're at and what you need. And I just want to ask you to deal with the weights, the sin. And maybe you need a reset this morning. You say, you know, my eyes really haven't been completely focused on Jesus. And I want to make a choice, a commitment today to to refocus. And I just want to ask you to to do whatever God leads you to do, whether it's to talk to someone, whether it's just to get alone with God at some point today and, and pour out your heart before Him. But I want to ask you, would you commit to positioning yourself so that God's transforming power could be at work in your life? Because He's called you to live for His glory. And He wants to restore your life so that it can bring glory to Himself. Father, I just pray for each person here this morning. I thank you for such an amazing group of students, counselors, faculty. Father, I am so privileged and blessed to get to spend some time with them. I'm encouraged by them, by their testimonies, by their hearts. And Father, I know that you have a great plan for every one of them. And so Father, I pray today that you would uh, intersect each of our lives Father, with your grace and your mercy. Father, if there's weight, Father, help us to cut it loose. Father, if there's sin, may we confess it. And Father, if we need to get help and accountability to deal with it, help us have the courage to do that. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to constantly fix our gaze on you. That your transforming power might be at work in us. And that the purpose of your salvation might be accomplished in our lives for your glory. And Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.